Okay, so really what I want to do today is a, do a little bit of a review. So I'm going to basically try to tell a story, okay? And obviously no story is fully complete, uh, so I will have to try to make it an overall review, a global view, rather than to go into a lot of very specific details. Because all the details, hopefully, will be, at, will be addressed by the rest of the speakers during the week. Is that okay? Yes, partially. Thank you very much. Anywhere else? Even uh, it has the, the photo attached to your belt. Okay, so <coughs> just to uh, say it again, I will will try to go over basically a broad, broad view of how do we, do we move from very early radiotherapy to what we have now, and perhaps I'm not even going to be able to touch the most advanced things, but at least to get us the framework for the rest of the week. So let me start by asking a question. How many of you are doing IMRT? Just raise your hand. Okay, so it's about maybe 15, 20%. How many of you are, you are you doing 3D conformal therapy using, you know, dose volume histograms for evaluation and so on? So it's about half. Okay, that's great. And how many of you are doing about basically 2D therapy in external beam. There is quite a few. Okay, not, not as many, but I mean quite a few. And who is not doing radiotherapy at all? There is a couple. Okay. All right, so uh, hopefully I will be discussing things that may be of interest for those that are going to be moving from 2D to 3D to IMRT. And hopefully I'm not going to bore all of you that are doing IMRT already. Okay, if you are bored, just leave and come back at the end. Okay, so <clears throat> let me basically um, tell you how, what did the process in radiotherapy looked very, very early on. We had a patient that was assessed, the physician decided to treat, decided what he wanted to treat, so he did some target localization, and we'll see you know, the sophistication of that. Uh, defined what the treatment was to be, calculate some treatment parameters, verify the patient position, and deliver the treatment, okay? Uh, this is an early radiotherapy in 1D, basically. There is basically no team. The physician decided to treat a breast tumor. He has an apparatus, a very early X-ray tube, puts it on the tumor, and he has a timer on his hand so that's the way he defines the treatment. That's the dosimetry at the time. Of course, I mean, this is many years ago, uh, probably much before I was even born. But what was the prescription in not necessarily those days, but even later on, I mean, in the 40s, 50s? This is a typical chart on a patient, the description of a patient in a chart. So what did we have here? There was some text, and I know that you cannot read it because it's blurry. But there is some text that says that this patient needs to be treated to the femoral head. Probably some, you know, complications, some metastasis and so on. And you have two drawings made by hand because the physician knows the anatomy and he draws what he knows about the anatomy. There is no x-rays. So he defines, and in this case you have a anterior, right anterior and right posterior. I don't know if you can read that. Uh, and it shows the extent of the fields. And basically that's a simulation if you want to kind of translate it into you know, modern days. So many of you have probably seen cobalt units. Cobalt units were introduced in around the, the 1950s. And there is a number of models that were available in the market. This happens to be one that I just saw uh, 
let, not even two years ago, in Russia, in Moscow. It's a very interesting unit, but it's a cobalt unit, and it has some specific motions that basically were designed to do radio surgery, if you believe it or not. Okay, but most of you probably will be familiar with a unit like this, a, oops, with a cobalt unit like this, more or less more modern, with a beam stopper, and the mechanism to generate the radiation is extremely simple. We have a head of the unit with some apertures that will allow the radiation to come out, collimators to restrict about the amount of the field size, and a radioactive unit, a pill, if you want, a radioactive source, that with a mechanism just to move it in front of the aperture, and you do the exposure, and you move it back, and that ends the exposure. So many of you have seen. Is anybody here not seen a cobalt unit or not worked with a cobalt unit? So there is a few. Well, that's interesting because I guess the majority of us, uh, particularly if you are my age, I mean, we definitely saw cobalt units. But um, the principles about doing, using cobalt and even later linear accelerators when they were just introduced it was basically a 1D, or if you want, and we'll see it in a moment, a 2D treatment. So what was the dosimetric calculation? What did you calculate those? Typically, we had what we called a SSD a beam on time table. It was a table that we generated based on some measurements, but, the, but all of those were completely related to just one number, and that number is this number here, the output of the unit. And this is from 1969. That was, I found it in the records in my hospital when I became chair of, uh, chief of physics in 1985. And it was in the records. And this is an interesting table, and I kept it because it was signed by Lillian Jacobson. Lillian Jacobson was a medical physicist in New York, one of the pioneer women in radiation therapy. And by the time I was there, she was, you know, long retired. But if you see here, this is a table for 80 centimeter SSD treatment with a single field, just to calculate the beam on time. How much time do we need to keep the beam on to give a specific amount of radiation? And in this case, the output was in rentgens per minute, not in rats, rentgens per minute at 80 centimeter SSD, 104. 0.8 rentgen, uh, rentgens per minute. And if you wanted to treat something which was, and this is specific for a 10 by 10 field at 100 SSD, and if you wanted something else, you just went through the table. Let's say you had a field that was bigger and was equivalent field size of 220 by 20, and with an, a particular depth, you calculate that this is the time that you need the, to have the beam on, and it gives you another number. And that's interesting, that this is, was another number was of importance, because if you gave the dose that you wanted at depth, you had a much higher dose somewhere else. Okay? And that was at the entrance of the beam. And these tables were used either for single fields or sometimes for two fields, per, perhaps parallel opposed. So, all done on I'm sorry? Is all measurements are done in air? I cannot understand. In air because the unit is in Rongen, so the measurement is done in air, not in water? No, no, this was in, in water. I mean, it was calculated in rentgens per, you know, per minute for the max. Yeah. Um, so, in radiotherapy 3D, if we were to summarize or just to say an overview, the planning is very simple, beam arrangements, and we'll see a little bit of an example of different beam arrangements. The prescription usually was to one point. That was all. And the calculations used either standard tables. Uh, we would correct for SSD sometimes. I mean, if you had a patient who was too large or you wanted to treat at an extended distance, you, you adjust for the different SSDs. And if there was a little bit of blocking, which was not very typical, at some point they would put some blocks on the corners. They, would, they knew they didn't want to treat too much tissue that was not necessary. And you will calculate what was the equivalent square. Okay, so there were formulas to do that. 
And you could have sometimes one other point of interest where you calculated the dose. But that was about it, OK? So as we moved with time, we came to an era of what I call the 2D treatment planning area or 2D radiotherapy process. So we added a few blocks to this diagram, to this flow diagram. And in addition to the, the acquisition of, sometimes we had an image, and we'll see it in a moment, you had different dose distribution calculations. And typically, the calculations at that time were done by hand. How many of you have done isodose curves calculated point by point by hand? One, two, three, good, four. Wow, so we are like a six, OK? Um, so, so, and then we had something which we call the plan approval. Somebody looked at the plan and decided uh, to check perhaps some of my, the numbers, transferred the information to the unit. Basically, it was just a number of beam on, for the beam on time, and uh, verify the things and deliver the treatment. So the, the, the process didn't get too much complicated. But in the 1980s, uh, there was a big output of radiation therapy textbooks. And I don't know if all of you are familiar with Fletcher's book. Anybody that didn't see the book? That was basically the, the, the textbook for radiation therapy physicians and physicists. But Fletcher's book, and this is the edition, the, I think it's the second edition from 1980, uh, and I took a couple of pictures just to illustrate one thing. If you look here, there is a radiograph. And you see this little marker here? It's a physical object that was put in the patient's, uh, into the patient's, up to the cervix. Okay, it was for treatment. And how is the field defined here? You see the field definition? It was a radiograph, and the physician drew with a marker. Just they drew it on the film. And that defined the field. But if you notice, there were some, well, I, you cannot notice it here if you read the book. There were some rules how to def, where to put the fields, because you couldn't see inside except for that marker. So if you went on the radiograph, you put the fields according to some certain rules. And the rules were related to the bony anatomy, because you couldn't see soft tissue. Now, when you take those, took these radiographs in order to know where you were to the outside of the field, because you couldn't put the patient, no, you couldn't treat the patient when you took the radiograph. You had to move it to the treatment machine. There were all kinds of very clever mechanical devices developed. And this is just one, where you had the x-ray tube was going to be connected to this plastic box. And the plastic box was attached through this marker. You see the marker is going into the, into the patient. And there were measurement devices and things that would allow you to relate the inside of the patient to the outside. Okay, And this is another one. So with all this, and the other thing that you knew, people started realizing the patients were not just made of a block of water. and. I know that some of you have seen this picture. Um, I know that Santiago did see that. Um, but anybody knows what this is? Huh? No? OK, well, for those of you that think it's a torture device, it's not. The torture device had the points coming in, the, the sharp points. This is just to take a patient's contour. And many of you have taken contours with other devices. There were all kinds of methods with plaster of Paris, with lead wire, and so on. But the idea was that because the patients were not square, we need to take into account the contour of the patient. So here we have uh, two diagrams. One of them, which is a series of diagrams, uh, we see the external contour of the patient. And we see a block here in the middle, this rectangle in the middle, which basically is the dimension of the two fields from the laterals and the anterior and posterior. That's our supposed target. That's what we want to treat. And there were fields which were calculated. And there is three diagrams here. The first one is an APPA a treatment. 
in which we try to treat this area. And in order to treat this area with APPA, we see that the, the isodoses, and this was to treat this with uh, about 5,000 uh, rats or centigrade at the, uh, nowadays. Uh, it had 5,500, 5, which means 10% more here, and up to 5,600 at some point. So basically, what this demonstrates is that with this type of treatments, uh, we couldn't really avoid over-treating normal tissue. And in order to compensate for that, new developments came along. One of them is to increase the energy of the beams with higher energy linear accelerators. By then, they were available. Or a Betatron, in this case, a 25 MeV Betatron. And you can see that even with the APPA, we improved the situation much better because now the 5,000, it's covering basically the box that we want to treat. But still, there is quite a significant dose outside. With the advent of isocentric machines that can rotate around the patient, it was much easier to keep the patient in place and irradiate from different directions. Typically, it was from very conventional directions, laterals, APPA, not, nothing too sophisticated. And with that, we came and made a big step forward because now the 5,000 not only enclosed this, but outside of the 5,000, we went down to less than 40%, in this case, 2,000 isodose line. Okay? So we made some advances in that direction, and then with the advent of some very primitive computerized treatment plans, we were able to calculate lines of isodoses on a very complex anatomy like this one. That's a, the that's a nasopharynx, I believe. And we were able to take into account wedges or other beam modifiers. Now, a, one of the things that this allows us to, if we were to summarize what this step allowed us to do, is that we started still keeping in mind that the target is defined in relation to uh, the anatomic landmarks, the bony, bony anatomy, essentially. But the extent of the field was still knowledge by the anatomy and the disease pathways, because you couldn't see every detail of the tissue. And the physicians needed to rely on knowing how diseases progressed. How did they know how the diseases progressed? Many times from post-mortems or, or surgery after the fact. So there was no way to know. So they had some rules. And if you were to treat something, you needed to treat the, the certain lymph node chains. So the physicians were the ones that had that knowledge and basically created the target that included all that stuff. And still, there was this extensive reliance on physical examination, palpation, physical measurements of the patients. The dose distribution information was still limited to one plane of interest, as we saw it before, just one plane, one, usually a cross plane. And the fields were set in order to cover the anatomy, and the energy selection was extremely important, as I just saw, show you in those three slides. The energy and the able to uh, come with, from different directions. And the protection of the critical organs was, again, set by experience. So if a physician, after doing probably dozens of cases, saw that there were certain complications with rectal bleeding, he knew that, I mean, he had to cut, cut down on the field sizes. Okay, so that's what the, the 2D radiotherapy period. So in the process, basically, we added a couple of more things. I mean, we just spoke about this and the measurements and contours and the beam arrangements and the dose calculations, obviously, all the rest. And we started seeing much more use of blocking. And the blocking sometimes was manual or was custom uh, made. And we have all the rest of the of the process. Many of you have seen pictures of patients with tattoos. Well, what was the idea of a tattoo? We wanted to know where to position the patient into the treatment beam. Usually, we had a crosser projecting to the, to the, to the patient that was 
your re reference to where your beam was going to be, and you needed to know the outside to the inside, the relation. And that was the purpose of the tattoos. The tattoos were, I'm sorry, the tattoos were done on um, under floral usually or some other method that you could relate them. With the introduction of simulators, radi uh, radiographic simulators, fluoroscopic simulators, uh, we still had to rely on palpation, the use of planar images, but we still didn't have information of actual volumes because usually X-ray units didn't have the capa capacity to give you the contrast for soft tissues, except in some cases. For instance, if the lung, if you could see clearly a mass in the lung, you could perhaps tell that. And, but we still were keeping the rules to the disease sites as the way to decide on what the field size should be. And the blocking was not done in order to conform the dose distribution to the target. It was mostly driven by avoiding complications. So that was the main, uh, uh, the main uh, purpose of blocking and shaping fields. Now, I hope I can keep a secret here. I mean, are you all promising not to divulge this, OK? All right, can I have all your promise? OK. Well, uh, basically, we never treated 2D patients with radiation therapy. I mean, we did all this stuff for many years. But I can tell you, all our patients were really three-dimensional. All our patients were three-dimensional. OK, we just didn't know any better because we could only use radiographs that collapse everything into one plane. Like, you know, you collapse everything, compress it. And all, we can only represent one, pay, one plane at a time, sometimes perhaps two. But our patients, all of them were three-dimensional. We didn't have two-dimensional patients, OK? So don't tell anybody because, I mean, otherwise we'll get in trouble. All right. So in the 1990s, I mean, about 10 years after Fletcher's book, there is another series of books with uh, the advent of city simulation. Cities became more accessible and more available to radiation therapy. And we see now the textbook is now all based on this type of images, CT images, OK? Now, I think this book, by the way, uh, I don't want to get in trouble myself, but I think if you Google it, you can probably download it you know, uh, from the internet, the whole book. OK, so what is different here? First of all, we have CTs. But only on, on top of the CTs, we have all these lines, which basically simulate fields or the width of fields on that particular plane. We have this type of image where we see superposed into a cross section of the patient, a reconstruction. And onto the reconstruction, these little loops here, which will go uh, further later. I mean, are basically the representation of targets that were defined on each city slice, but reconstructed in a way that we can superimpose it into the radiograph, where the radiograph, origin, the regular radiograph, wouldn't allow us to see that. And we can shape now beams or, or apertures, and we can do diagrams of different kinds. So very powerful tools. So what is basically, if we wanted to get a definition of 3D conformal radiotherapy is basically this. Designing and delivering both the design and the delivery of treatment plans based on 3D image sets with the treatment fields individually shaped to treat just the target that we want to treat. Basically, that would be the, your operational definition of 3D conformal therapy. Now, Obviously, this required a lot of new tools that the new treatment planning systems started developing. First of all, being able to design beam orientations on a structure which is reconstructed from multiple planes. We were able to display what's called the beam side view. A simulator, basically, was a device that had a beam side view because the source, as Justus explained the other day on Friday, 
I mean, the source is located geometrically in the same configuration as the radiation source for the radiation treatment unit. But now we wanted to do it before with based on CT. So there were geometric projections that you could use. You could design or plan beam weights to compensate for different amounts that you wanted to come into the target from different directions. We could calculate the dose distribution throughout the volume. And that was an important thing, because before that, we were doing it only one plane at a time. Now we can calculate it through the volume, which meant the computation of the 3D dose, both for the target and for critical structures, was required a much higher sophistication of the algorithms to calculate the dose. Because if we could, before, calculate just a, a ray trace on one, onto each point on a plane, now we had to calculate the contribution from a ray coming in this plane onto the plane behind it or before it. So this required new algorithms for those computation. And I don't remember if somebody is giving a talk about this or not, but this is a very important part of it. And the other thing that this allowed us is to use what's called those volume histograms. Is I, I'm sure that everybody that's doing conformal and IMRT is being using those volume histograms. Is somebody that is not familiar with the concept of those volume histograms. Everybody knows that. OK, so that's great. Um, so, but those volume histograms required that you define the volumes for calculating the dose to those volumes. And that was only feasible with the advent of heavy use of CT images. And another thing that started to be developed is to be able to calculate predictively, or to at least have some models, and I'm sure that Colin Orton is going to talk about this, about tumor control probabilities and normal tissue complications probabilities. So all of that was made possible by this big advance. The process got a little bit more complicated along the way. So we had now 3D dose matrices, statistics on those matrices, like the DVH is a statistic. And, and so on. I'm going to skip a little bit because um, I know my talk is long, and uh, Sam was very generous and allowed me to extend a little bit on a few things that will make you know a preparation for his talk. So I'll ask you to bear with me. So uh, the, I apologize for that's a bad quality image. It's, it's fuzzy, but what I wanted to show you is that. Because we were trying to be tighter to the target now, the issue of immobilization, of making sure that the patient was in the same place all the time and every time, became a little bit more important. But not only that. You see all this writing on this immobilization? I don't like to call it immobilization, because really, if any of you has been inside of one of these, you know that you are not immobile. You can really move around that, OK? But it's basically to remind the patient, don't you know, just walk out of the table, OK? <laughs> um, so the, but you see all these things? Well, these are not uh, get well wishes that somebody tattoos on somebody breaks a hand, and you know, just they do on the cast and so on. They, these were many times instructions. OK, well, we did this alignment to this position when we did the CT. But when we want to treat, we want you to move three centimeters superior and, and maybe two centimeters to the left of the patient. And all those are instructions. And this became a very important place where errors could be made. Okay, But we are not going to talk about errors today. We'll talk about this, I think, on Thursday. So how did we know the outside to the inside? We couldn't know that unless we put something physically that showed on the CT, but was physically on the patient. So. This is like a central cut for one simula simulation. You see these little dots here, basically are high Z BBs or some other material that, could, that you could relate any anatomy inside the patient to that point that was tattooed on the patient outside. Because otherwise, we cannot do these CTs every time we treat. 
except that nowadays there are some new, 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 new techniques where you do CT simulation every single fraction. Okay, but that's you know much later. So if we went to, um, so we had those reference marks, and basically the other thing that we needed to do is in order to define what the target is, we needed to be a little bit more sophisticated and say, well, what, how, what are these things that go into the thinking process of the physician in order to come up from what he sees to what he wants to treat? And once he tells us what he wants to treat, how do we assure that what he wants to treat is going to be treated every day? And there we have all these new concepts of GTV, the gross tumor volume, that's what you can see. You know, I can see, you can see, anybody can perhaps see, maybe not necessarily interpret very well, but we can see it, to the clinical target volume. The clinical target volume is completely a clinical decision. It's not up to physicists or anybody else other than the physician, the radiation oncologist, to decide. He needs to decide, this is what I see, but I need to treat this because there is microscopic disease or there is certain things that I need to consider. Needs to be treated every single day to such and such dose. So, and that's the clinical target volume. Then, once we get that, we have what's called the planning target volume because not the, vo the volume that the physician wants to treat, we have to enlarge it or make accommodations because nothing is perfect in life, okay? Except a few of you and myself that we all think that we are totally perfect, everything else is not, okay? And treatment, radiation therapy is not perfect either. So we have to accommodate for all these things and then we come up with what's uh, called the PTV, the planning target volume, which is what we want to cover every single day. And we need to define also the volumes that are at risk that we want to protect. Otherwise, we won't be able to calculate what if we don't define the volumes at risk. What? Huh? I cannot hear. The DVH. I mean, we won't be able to calculate DVH on something that we don't define. All right? Okay, so... This is still conformal therapy. And just to get an idea about how this works in, 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 in the process, why did we need to go all through all these steps? Is because before we were setting up fields which were very simplistic, like blocks or so on, or squares, rectangles. But if we look at any anatomy, and this is just a prostate case, and you can see the prostate, the patient is prone, so there is the bladder and the rectum, the rectal wall. But if we move a few centimeters superior to that, that anatomy changed significantly. Here we are already beyond the prostate into the seminal vesicles. The bladder is much bigger. The rectum is different, and the femoral heads are different, and so on. So this is where the three-dimensionality comes about. And if we represent it into a beam side view with a DV, uh, um, a digitally reconstructed radiograph, we can project those volumes here. Now, I want to tell you a little story because that's when we started doing a 3D conformal therapy in our department. Our, both the physicists and the physicians were, were all used to the old school. So one of the first things that we did is we, take, we took this digitally reconstructed radiograph and we had very experienced radiation oncologists, and some of them were even radiologists, because at the time, I don't know in many of your, the countries that you work in, many of the old school were trained in radiology and radiation oncology, both. So we took this uh, digitally reconstructed radiograph. This is the right view from that, lateral. And we say, I didn't show th these things, okay? We didn't show this, and we didn't show the, f uh, and we, we told the physician, well, how would you treat this? Well, what, can you just draw the fields? Okay, uh, for those of you that remember, I mean, for the prostate, and the treatment was a pres prescribed to 65 gray to the isocenter, and this is a small prostate, but we didn't show that, so we just showed the anatomy. He didn't know really what the prostate was. 
So how did it, did it go? It takes a 10 by 10 for the lateral. This is a 10 by 10 field. Takes it two centimeters posterior to the symphysis pubis, okay? The center, the isocenter is at the, at the, at the same level, at, the, at that level. And, and this is one of the fields. So you went through all these fields, drew the fields, and say, well, okay, well, let's now calculate the dose distribution from your fields. We didn't show him this, the, the, actually, the, the volumes, okay? He only saw the radiographs, because that's what, what he would have done before that, correct? So we show the dose distribution, we project it, calculate it, show it in three, in, in a isometric display, and we're showing, well, this is it here. This is the prostate. These are the lines that describe the process that he, he delineated. And this is the cloud of the 65 gray that you prescribed. Okay? What would you say? He says, oh my God, we missed it. We are missing the completely. All right? We are treating outside. So I say, okay, don't worry. Okay, because that's not the end of the, the complete story. This is 65 gray. If we just take that cloud, but take it to 63 gray, which is just 3% below the prescription, okay, it's not so bad. Look, see, nice, you covered everything, except that you treated all this that you didn't need to treat, all right? So, and we did that for not just a small prostate, but for a large prostate, okay? In the past, before we had CT, we wouldn't know the difference. So for a large prostate, the 63 gray, well, it was a little better, but still we missed part of it and we still were treating all this of the rectum. But this was what used to be the standard of practice in radiation therapy for prostate treatment. There was no better way to do it. So, virtual simulation was something that happened when the CT scanners made, were made available, and some companies, in this case a speaker, um, developed software to work with the simulator to be able to project your beams onto the anatomy. The, that software usually, nowadays, all those that, of you that have IMRT, I'm almost sure, they all have the equivalent software, so there is no need of another so piece of software somewhere else. But the basic thing that I want to show is this, that what this allows us to do is to project beams in directions that in the past we couldn't use the bony landmarks to define our fields because this was totally you know, not something was easy to interpret. And in this case, you have like a 45 degree beam, and you can see the diagram of the beam coming here. And we, can, we started being able to uh, not only select the field size electronically, but also select, a, in this case, is a multi-leaf collimator setting. What does that allows us to do is the following. Not only we can shape the fields, rotate collimator angles, rotate gantry angles, and so on, but defining the fields, we couldn't define them unless we had what? We had to have the anatomy delineated. Without that, we couldn't tell where to go. Okay? So this was a big advancement. So with this, we needed some new tools. And that was the portal evaluation tools. How did we know that what we simulated, we are actually able to confirm when we go to the machine? And obviously, the DRRs, the digitally reconstructed radiographs, were the central element. Instead of your regular radiograph, you have a digital radiograph. And port verifications films were still being used at the time. How many of you take port films with film? Very few. That's it? Okay, so it's about eight or ten. How many of you take port films with uh, onboard imagers or, or, or digital, you know, epids? 
electronic portal imaging. So that's more now. Okay, so we still have people that are taking film, and, but when we started, uh, obviously, the, we were just taking films. And now you can take them with EPITs that are integrated into the head of the machine, both for diagnostic quality x-rays and high energy beams. And, but you need to be able to compare you know, one image from one system to another image. The digitally reconstructed radiograph came from the, C the CT scanner. So those tools are an important component of being able to verify that what you plan to do is what you are going to be doing when the patient is under, going to be treated. So we could get conformal plans in this case and I want to, to point to your, this number, 77.4 gray, to the PTV. The first one that I showed when we just started conformal, 65 to the isocenter, 63 to the periphery. Now we are going to 77.4, and that was just when we started. And I'll show you why we were doing this. This is now a conformal field. Now you can conform it with blocks or you can conform with MLC. There is no need to have an MLC, an absolute need to do 3D conformal therapy unless you have an MLC. It makes it much simpler, much, much easier, but it's not a must. As a matter of fact, we started doing conformal 3D with blocks, okay? So I want to mention that because some people may think Unless you have an MLC, you cannot start doing some conformal. And with that, we were able to do things which were much tighter distributed around the target, okay? And with doses much higher. And that didn't make a difference whether we were treating a small volume or a larger volume. What else came along when we started doing CT we got very nice images, but better than radiographs. But there was also a need to integrate other information. And this is an example. If this is a patient which is scanned, and I'm not a radiation oncologist, I'm not a, radio, a diagnostic radiologist. If somebody shows me, you know, tells me what's wrong with this patient, I would say probably something around, this looks weird, this much different than this. Yeah, would you all agree? But I wouldn't be able to tell, I said, May, maybe there is something here, okay? Well, with the advent of MRI, okay, we could do much, much better, okay? This is a, the same set of cross sections taken from a set of MRIs where you have much, much better contrast resolution. So soft tissue can be really beautifully displayed. The only thing is that usually MRIs are not in the radiation oncology department. How many of you have access to MRI? Okay, about 10, eight. Um, and any of you, who has MRI in their department, in the radiation oncology department? One, great, <laughs> okay, but the majority, okay, of cases, you have to have the patient sent somewhere else for an MRI. MRI images are usually taken under different circumstances. The patient is not immobilized. The patient may be in totally different position. So once you get that image set, you need to do what's called image registration. You have to register the sets and you have to generate artificially artificially reconstructed cross sections that match your CT if you want to compare the two. And that's what we are doing here, next to each other. So this was not the original set, but from the original set you could just re-slice it, reconstruct it, move it, magnify it, tilt it, etc. So once you have that tool though, which is extremely useful, you need to have some tools to check whether what you are doing is correct. And new tools were developed. This is just an example of it, it's called the checkerboard, the chess you know, board if you want, where you see alternating pieces of CT and MRI, CT and MRI in a pattern. 
And you can see that, for instance, this is the bone in the CT, which is shown as a bright area because it has a lot of calcium. And in the MRI, it hardly shows. It's a black. It doesn't have signal because there is no free, free protons. And, but, you can, but what you need to do is this is your quality assurance that your reconstruction was correct and you go from one to another in a smooth transition. And you can see this here as, as well. Okay? This is black, white. This becomes black in the MR. Okay? So we have those tools. There is many new tools now available which is a ability to project the beams onto the patient's skin or the external anatomy. In this case, the patient is also in an immobilization mask. But you can project the fields for each one of those directions. Not only that, uh, you have to now have a new component. Because now you have immobilization devices, and you have to know how to treat them dosimetrically. So there is a reference at the bottom of the screen there that I encourage you to look at. It's an AAPM task report on immobilization devices on their effect on beam dosimetry, including, what's that? Three minutes. Three minutes. Uh, I borrowed a few minutes from Sam. He agreed gently, get gently to do that. OK? <laughs> so, uh, um, so I would encourage you to download. All of these are free. I'll just give you the reference. OK. What the other thing is we can do now is do non-coplanar beams. Before, we were limited to the simulator. You know, we could sometimes steal the couch. It was very complex and difficult to tell what you were doing. And the most important thing is like you can treat now with beams that come from here. Now, what's the problem with that? Any problem with that? Huh? The dose to the body, good. OK? You need to keep in mind, although this ends the body here, because that's where they stop the last slice in the head, but the patient continues. So if we were to do something like that, we must make sure that this beam doesn't go exit through the body. And we may want to tilt the head so it exits in front of the body. Okay, so all these things are new tools that we are aware, but they are not perfect. So you need to understand a little more than just what you see on the images. Okay, so I'm going to skip all this. But one important thing, and this is what probably for me was one of the big things about 3D conformal. Any of you treat craniospinal irradiation of children? Quite a few of you. What do we do? We treat laterals. We treat the posterior spine field, or sometimes two if it's too long, and so on. Well, and physicians knew from past complications that they needed to keep a proper gap in the junction, correct? Well, how do before we had CT, we couldn't know exactly the dose distribution around that gap. And here we have a case where I can project everything on the patient. And I see this is the gap that we created. But there is a serious underdose there. And we don't want that either, because that is basically a source of a recurrence. Okay? So by doing 3D conformal, we are able to do all these improvements and go from here to this, where we have a much, it's still safe. And we can take other steps to make it safe so there is no accidental overlap. But we can basically treat it in a more reliable way. So I'm not going to go through this, because you'll have all, you have all these presentations in your package, I believe. Renato, when they they are going to get all this? Yes, they will be uploaded on the website. OK. All right. So I'm not going to recite this. You can read it yourself. But basically, <laughs> this is essential use of CT information for 3D. and. Basically, the DVH is one of the main tools that now we must use for plan evaluation. I'm not going to go into that. That would be a separate lecture. But the main Im importance of this development of the DVH is that now we started accumulating gradually 
information about the actual doses to sensitive organs. And not only to the organs, but also to parts of the organs. Now, we are far from being able to have a complete prescription, what an organ tolerance is in terms of partial dose, and particularly when the, the dose is fractionated in different ways. But that will not have been possible without the development of 3D conformal with DVHs, OK? We wouldn't even have the information available. So um, this is just to illustrate. I mean, these are two DVHs for the dose escalation on that prostate case. One was prescribed to 6,500, 65 uh, gray. But it was to the isocenter. We went from prescribing to the isocenter to prescribing to the 97, 95% isodose, which meant that we have not only a sharper fall-off, but we went to doses which were significantly higher. So that was great. And why did we do that? Well, this is a slide from 1998. So this is right the beginning of 3D conformal, maybe. And this is from Memorial Sloan Kettering. It shows these statistics of relapse-free survival of patients with pro treated for prostate cancer with two different regimes, 64 to 70 and 75 to 80, 81. And what this shows is that, sure, within a year or two years even, up to two, a year and a half or two years, didn't make any difference. Patients did almost the same. But if you look five years down the line, up to here, basically we missed four out of five patients had relapses, four out of five. Whereas when they went to higher doses, okay, it was per perhaps every other patient had a relapse. Still not good, but much better than before. The, and that was confirmed with another study and so on. The issue with that was, and we all know that, I mean, that in, in theory at least, we knew about these curves, okay, about tumor control probabilities. And we know that if we increase the dose, we have a better probability of control and different uh, aggressiveness of disease are different curves. But we, we knew those in theory. Now, here we start having some actual dose points. And this is from 1998. So it's already almost 20 years ago. And we could see that there was an increased importance to treat with higher doses. And we were, people at that time were already starting to talk about treating to 81 gray. The only problem with that was this. Can you tell what this is? These are statistics on complications and morbidities. At 65 gray, everybody was safe, no problem. Okay, they were just not cured, but there was no problem, no complications. And as we started increasing the doses, this is a 76, that would be 81. Look at this, for instance. A GI complications, about 30%. Every third patient has a complication. That's, no physician wants to see that. Okay? So because of that, People knew that, yes, you wanted to go higher, but you couldn't do it freely. There was a price to pay. And the way of that, if I was you know, starting my new career as a, as, a, as a drama writer, okay, I would basically write the drama of radiotherapy. Okay? We can give radiation doses as high as we want. We can sterilize any tumor and cure, supposedly, any localized cancer except those tissues that get in the way and they ruin our wonderful technology and they create complications for us, okay? So basically, I'm going back to one of those slides that you saw before with the 3D. I mean, if we come from a lateral, I mean, we, it's not too difficult to see how we can shape the beam so we avoid the, rec the, the bladder, we avoid the rectum. But as soon as we start doing these other directions, we start overlapping. And no matter how we do this, in order to cover this, 
we will be covering quite a bit of rectum and quite a bit of bladder. And there is no technology that can let us avoid just by shaping the beam. That doesn't matter, blocks or MLCs and so on. So we started the process of IMRT. And IMRT, I mean, was modulating the intensity in order to overcome that problem. And I'm going to just give a short example about the IMRT without inverse optimization, OK? Uh, we all knew about intensity modulation when we used wedges. That was a one-dimensional modulation, basically, from left to right or right to left. Compensators, anybody if you use compensators? That was a two-dimensional you know, intensity modulation. Cone beams. People went to cone beam. We treated like 4,500, and then went down for another 2,000 to a smaller field. That's intensity modulation. It's just temporal intensity modulation, two steps by level. Then there were dynamic ways. Instead of wedges, multi, uh, dynamic wedges, independent jaws, we made with independent jaws, the multi-leaf and the slit field. I don't go into detail. But I just want to show you what many tend to call this poor man's IMRT. Okay? This is a case for uh, a breast, and that's a place where this is very easy to implement. I'm just going to show an example. Uh, typically, if you just come with the tangents, you have a hot spot here because there is much less tissue in this, in, uh, at, at the apex of the breast. So, what do we typically used to do is put wedges. But the wedges are one dimensional, so they only compensate in this direction, from here to here. But they cannot do anything else, and they cannot compensate in the superior inferior direction. So, one way to do that is you start with two tangents without wedges at all, and you look at your isodose distribution, so from a cross-section, you will see these hot spots up to 15 or 20 percent hot spots that are not acceptable. And if you look at that from the beam side view direction, this is our median border of the field, that's the apex, and you project the dose distribution on that, but you just project the hot spot, in this case, the 115% hot spot. You generate like a, a, a volume of those, and you block that, sorry, you block that with your MLC. You see, this is blocked now. So we created a second field now, which is just this part. And you do it again now for the 110%. You move the leaves again. And you create another field, which is much smaller, much more posterior, and the last one. And you can do that. And you can achieve a very nice distribution by just weighing how much beam you give onto each of these four segments of the same field. So it's the same field geometrically, except that it's blocked progressively. And obviously, the majority of the field will be given, the majority of monitor units, with the first one, which was the open, but you don't give it all of it. And you see the relative weight of that was only 86%. And you do it in three or four steps, and you can get pretty nice dose distribution. The advantage of that is that you can also compensate in this direction. Okay, So that's what people call forward planning or uh, poor man's IMRT. So IMRT is really conformal therapy except that we have to add the modulation to the beam. So that was just a very simple example. But typically, we, need, we will go to inverse optimization. Inverse optimization is basically, instead of us using the judgment after we do a dose calculation to say, well, this is acceptable. Let's move this. Let's change that. We say, this is what we want to achieve. And we'll give all that information to a black box, a computer, and let them do the job for us. We can go take coffee, come back in an hour. It's all done for us. Except that computers don't know radiotherapy. They don't. They just don't know. They only understand numbers. Okay. So 
there are some steps that we need to add to the process now. And one of them is this one. Define the treatment planning, the, the planning, the treatment, and the volume at risk. And we need to define all of them. Now, <clears throat> all of you must have read ICRU 50 and ICRU 52. Anybody didn't? OK, those that are lying, just raise your hand. OK, all right. So you, if, if you didn't, you should. <laughs> OK, if you didn't, you should. It's free, uh, I don't know if it's freely available, but the information is available in many places. So, but basically, this is a cartoon. If I want to treat this, the GTV, which is what we see, and this is next to something else, which is the organ in blue, or this other organ in blue, uh, the physician will tell me, well, I don't want to treat this. I want the CTV. This is what the clinical target should be. And then by then, we add a margin because we say, well, we are not perfect, so we added this margin. And we end up actually designing beams, and we end up treating something that looks like this, this pink area. And obviously, that is the area where hopefully we manage to cover everything. Uh, and, but there, there, is, there is a conflict. There is a conflict. We cannot do this if we want to not treat the other. Right? And that conflict needs to be resolved. So the first thing is to define what the volumes are. Well, the beginning we were treating a little box. You yeah? remember a block, a brick. Now these are the volumes that we are defining. And these are just the typical definitions of a volume for a head and neck. And I think we covered some of that in the exercise on Friday, or we are covering it today. Today, today, I'm sorry. Um, but this is the list of volumes. Some of these volumes are real volumes. Some of them are theoretical volumes. Basically, you say it's an imaginary volume that you want to treat. And the important thing is that people need to train in how to define those volumes. The physicians, particularly the ones that we started with, were not familiar with designing volumes in cross sections. So there is a full thing of training that needs to take place for you to do that, for you and your physicians, basically, not just you. Um, the one thing I want to warn you, and this is typical from what happened at the beginning. This is a volume, and we expanded it, and you look at this. I've never seen an anatomic volume that looks like that, a scallop thing. Typically, in the anatomy, things are much smoother. So, and the reason is that when you, when you delineate in one cross section, you have this. So you see, look, this is pretty smooth. Everything is nice. But you go to the next one, you forgot what this was, OK? And you put it in the thing. When you put it in the stack and you show it, it's obvious that it you know, needs to be adjusted. But these are just the volumes. And you have to define not only the target, the GTV in this case, but all the rest of the things that you are interested in knowing those about. And I'm not going to talk about this because you can read a little bit about the uncertainties. But the, you have to different categories of extractions or extrapolations of the volumes that you started from. Um, I'm just going to say one thing, that there is internal margins that are added to that volume. Some of those margins, you have no control. That's part of the way the body is built. But some of the margins are due to uncertainties in the localization. And then we'll go back to that later, OK? So the uncertainties in localization, or this setup margins, this is something that you must make a big effort to reduce. Because otherwise, you keep expanding those volumes, and there is a cost, a physical, medical cost to the patient by doing this. So now you have to define what are the prescriptions goals. What is your prescription? And the prescription, there is a new concept. It's not now, well, I'm going to treat this to volume to that kind of dose. And then if it doesn't work, you go back and you make adjustments. Now you have to tell it all up front to the computer. So you have to de the desired DVHs. Basically, you define your volume dose constraints by the DVH of, over that volume. And you need to assign goals, priorities, and penalties. I will give a couple of words about that. So this is the new fashion in prescriptions. 
you know? Uh, Fifth Avenue, New York City. That's the fashion now, okay? These are the prescription. In, this is a prescription in IMRT. I'm just going to talk about a couple of little things. There is, there is a number of points. I mean, you, you can define what's the resolution. And there is these numbers, priorities, 80, 90, 85. And these are arbitrary numbers. But I'm going to refer to those because you need to understand what that black box is doing behind the scenes. So we do it for critical structures as well as targets. How do we know what the critical stru structures can tolerate? There is, first of all, your facility has to develop those numbers. You should not take those numbers from somebody else. You can get help from other places, but everybody needs to get their own set of tolerances because that's what your facility feels comfortable with doing. And this is just an example. I'm not telling you to take that. I'm just telling you this exists. You can look at that. And it's free in the internet. Uh, Nathan Childress, I mean, did that and he put it on the web so anybody can download it and it's a nice spreadsheet. But what it has is for different structures, you can see the different amount of volume. Some structures will tolerate different doses to different parts of the volume. And there is some endpoints, and there is some references from RTOG studies and so on. So my take home lesson here, do not use that table. Just develop your own. You can just take that one, modify it, and use it for your facility. But the bottom line is you need to have those DVH limits in order to do IMRT, OK? So inverse optimization. Now we are going to give all this information to a computer. Tell me the, tell me the result. Um, Sam. <laughs> huh? You want me to go ahead? All right. OK. OK, so basically, we are giving the computer a problem, which is just a simple mathematical problem, relatively simple. It's not that complex. What's the inverse problem? It's an inverse problem, basically. Let's say that we have some tissue. There is some target, this green area. And there is a point i, or the point i can be anywhere in this thing. And we have. In, in this case, schematically, we have three beams, one here, one here, and one here. And each beam is in homogeneous, of in homogeneous intensity. And that's what these xj's are, that the intensity for each one of those beamlets, these portions of the beam. So the dose to a point i, basically, is the contribution from x, each one of these little intensities times a factor which is basically a matrix, is for this, this unit, dense, unit fluence to this point, there is such and such contribution. That's the DI, D, 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 I, DJIs, OK? So we calculate those. So just the dose to the point I is the sum of all those contributions. Very simple. And then we create an objective function. That's a function that we create. It, there is nothing anatomic or, 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 or clinical about that. It's a function because we need to tell the computer how is it going to judge if this is a good match or it's not a good match to what we wanted to achieve. So a tip, a, an example of an, an, an objective function, and that's just one example, is we create a, an artificial function, which is a function of these two vect of this vector x. And vex it's a vector, basically. It's a number of numbers. And that's the sum of the differences between what I prescribe for that point and what the calculation gives me to that point for that intensity x, the distribution of intensity is x. And I give it some weights, wi's. And these are the numbers that indirectly relate to those priorities that we saw before. 
Well, if I create this function, which is a quadratic difference, it's, it's useful because it tells me if di, what I calculate for that point, is what I prescribed, that function is 0. I'm just right on, on that dose. OK, perfect. And for each point, obviously, I have to calculate it. But if it's different, either bigger or smaller, that's why I take the square of it, I say that's not good enough. This function has a value which is different from 0, positive, you know, above 0. And what do I want? I want to make this all perfect. So I want this, ideally, I would like all these numbers to be 0. So I would say, well, if they are not 0, change the intensities, the excess, until you minimize that, bring it as close to 0 as possible. That's inverse optimization. That's all there is. All right? Is this new for any of you? You all knew that? OK, great. No, sorry. So once we have that, then the question of what are those Ws? The Ws are related to those priorities. So there is two types of, the, of Ws. For a target, I want to give a penalty or calculate a numeric value which is different from 0, which is bigger if, it's, if I go above the prescribed dose, and I probably can, should give a, a range of doses, a lower and upper border of the prescription. If, if I'm above that, and it's for the target, I say, that's not OK. It's OK. I mean, because I will give more dose to the target, and that's usually not too bad. If I am below, I want to give a bigger slope or a bigger quadratic uh, function. Because I don't want to underdose the target. That's the goal of my treatment. Okay, So I can have two different Ws. On the other hand, for an organ at risk, I don't care if I give it zero dose. Okay, So there is no penalty for giving less dose. But there should be a penalty if I give more dose. And obviously, each organ can have a different value of W, and these curves will look different. But all this is behind the scenes. So when I go to the actual plan optimization, the computer will do this. I will get a beam side view for each beam. And I can divide that field into mini beams or beamlets. Each beamlet, I, you know, just for this example, could be a, a one, one by one centimeter square beamlet or five by five, depending or if you do it with a multi-leaf, what is the size? And the computer will start iterating and giving me intensities that keep changing. After each calculation, it will calculate those numbers. Is this better or worse? It will go back and calculate and do this millions of times. OK? Yeah. So at some point, this finishes, OK? And we have, uh, this is a control. I mean, I don't, I'm not going to go that. The process has to end at some point. You either end it manually, or you give it some preset parameters. And this is what you wanted. Basically, your DVH points, you could select a number of points. This is from a variant system. But uh, other systems have similar things. And this actual calculated DVHs will keep updating as the, the, the system progresses. And you end up with a distribution, the desired distribution of fluence that you want to use. 
something like this for a prostate, a pr prostate a, a posterior field. This is the shadow of the rectum in the middle. And these are the two sides of the prostate probably going on the sides of the thing. So this is a typical, just a, an example of a dose distribution. This is in two dimensions. But how do we create that? Uh, how do we create that? Let's just take one slice. So we want, let's say, a distribution which looks like this of intensity calculated by the optimization program. How do we actually do that? There are numerous ways of implementing this. Just, this is just one example. Let's say that this is along the path of one pair of leaves, left and right. Okay? So we first of all divide this in 10 segments, let's say, 10, 10 intensity levels. For each intensity level, we'll have a point, and we bring the left side leaf to this point, the right one to this point. The reds are when the intensity is going down, the yellows, the intensity going up. And we deliver a tenth of the intensity, or we calculate the, the tenth of intensity, and we move to the next one, and another ten, and another ten, until we get to the last point of the going down. At that point, this will leaf will jump to the other side, and we continue doing it. We just build this 10% at a time and increase that, and we are done, OK? This can be delivered with MLCs, either sliding window, step and shoot. I'm, I'm sure you'll hear about this plenty. You need to review the plan, because that was a theoretical intensity delivered. Now, that we, and because that has be, to be done in order to make the algorithm move fast, this is not the actual fluence going to be delivered. Because the actual fluence has to take into account that there is leakage between the leaves. There is a, there is a different intensity along the tip of the leaves, the distribution, and so on. So all these calculations need to be repeated. And most of the systems will incorporate that at the last step. Um, so the first thing is, how do we know that what we deliver is right the first time that we are going to deliver? So we need to associate this DMLC or, or files for the motion of the leaves. And we need to verify that each, the, each say, at the start of the beam, when we were setting the patients, what did we do in order to, deliver, to know that the patient was treated correctly? Let's say we had the shapes filled. I mean, many times they tattooed or they marked the patient on the skin. We went to put the field, the field size with the light field looked at the patient, we walked out of the room and turned the beam. Okay? Now it's a little more complicated because there is no one shape. Okay? But there is like an, a, an initial shape. So we can have the DRR, this is the DRR, with the leaves, the starting position of the leaves. We can incorporate that into the treatment tube, the control area, and we can take a port film with the leaves in that position before we treat. And now we could look at this. We have this graticle, which tells us where the cross, the crosser would have been in an optical field. And we see that this is the right position. Basically, it's like a fingerprint of the field. Each one will be different. And that's your start position. So you confirm that. And now you can, I'm not going to go through that. Uh, the question is, how do we know next day, the next day, the next day, that we are doing the same thing, OK? Well, there is a variety of methods. I'm not going to, again, go into detail. But first of all, it's very important to do continuous quality assurance of the motion of the leaves. And the machine, you need to verify it very, at very close periods that, you're, that the, the MLC is performing according to the specifications or the quality control program that you had. You need to, you, and you are able, in most systems, you are able to have a file, a digital file, that tells you, for this field, on this day, the leaves moved correctly to this position, this position, this was so much time, and so on. And so this is a digital file. You have to have some way of 
looking at that, that it's not, you're not going to get dizzy after 20 seconds, but this is a, it's a one way of, of checking. And the, the electronic patient record. This is one of our therapists when we started IMRT. And he's happy and smiling. So I asked him, what are you smiling? He says, well, uh, with IMRT, we started with an 80 leaf or 52 leaf uh, MLC, 52 leaves. And he says, well, with, oh, that was an 80 leaf, I'm sorry. He was on the other machine that had the 40 leaf MLCs. Uh, he says, well, you know, I would have to just check for every day about 2,000 parameters, 15,000 leaf positions, and everything has to be right every day. I say, well, what are you happy about? And he says, well, you know, the record and verify. I mean, without the record and verify, forget it. I mean, this is not really uh, possible, okay? So record and verify systems, and IAEA has a publication. It's all in there. You need, don't need to write it down, and you can download it about um, record and verification systems. So, okay, let, uh, let me skip this because otherwise Sam is going to be really mad at me. Okay, I'm not going to talk about this. Um, so basically, what's the challenge here? Everything looks so good, but the challenge is that the better we can fix the target or know where the target is and deliver the dose, eh, we will be able to spare the dose to critical structures. However, the tighter the dose distribution we make, the better we must know where the target is at all times. Because otherwise, we will just get the opposite result. We'll get a very tight distribution and miss the, miss the tumor, or hit a sensitive structure with it. So uh, there is plenty of material. The APM has published reports. This is one of them. Uh, you should be able to download it for free. The IAA has published a very, very nice document, which is the transition from 2D to 3D and to IMRT. I strongly encourage you to look at this table. Table one is to classify conformal therapy. What you are doing in your department, which level are you? Level one, level two, level three. And this is conformal therapy. And the other tool that is there also, which is I really urge you when you go, even before you go home, just do it tonight, okay? Look at Appendix A. It's about 50, 50 questions and, and 12 more questions for IMRT. 50 questions for 3D. Are you doing A, B, C, D, E? Are you doing it? If you're not doing it, it's not a shame. Just this is something that you need to move along. This is what you need to do. That's your to-do list. But unless you do that and you go through all this list, you probably may be missing some things. <coughs> so if you are going to move along this chain, 2D to 3D to IMRT, do this exercise, look at the table, make it, you know, write it for your institution, for your situation, and then do the self-assessment questionnaire, which is in the Appendix A. Uh, I'm going to give you this, which is, I call it the reference of references. And this is a colleague, Jake Van Dyke. Many of you probably have heard him or know about him. He put a, a series of books, Modern Technology of Radiation Oncology, a compendium. One of the chapters, chapter 16, it's freely available. You can download it. And he updates it, I think, once or twice a year with new references. And you can just go to medical physics. This is the... the the reference, and you can download it, and from there you'll have, you know, directions to access almost anything you can think of. And if there is something it's not there, let him know; he will be happy to add it. Okay, so IMRT is a powerful and sharp tool in the treatment of cancer with radiation, but we must use it with great care. Okay, very careful; otherwise, you may cut your finger. Okay, thank you, Sam. Thank you for your...